Hey guys, I am so excited to announce that the movie that you've been waiting for, the documentary Dr. Patient, is now available for rent or purchase at drpatientmovie.com. Check out the trailer here. When I really knew something was wrong was when I started having trouble walking up the stairs. I was supposed to be grateful and happy and healing and well and thriving, but I did not feel that way. I was so sick. Like always, I wanted to find an answer and I had to figure it out, and I had to figure it out to save my own life. So I dove in. Jill is the leading voice in biotoxin illness and chronic conditions that are driven by toxicity. Oh my gosh, you're dealing with mold? You have to work with Dr. Jill Carnahan. Dr. Jill was the first person that actually began to shed some light on the problem. What I do is listen to the patient and we together talk about what else is possible. I don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> she saved my life. The deepest lessons and most profound insights come in the suffering, come in the dark moments. Self-compassion is the healing transition that, that shifts something inside of us. It's actually the thing that we need most in order to heal. Dr. Patient. Available now at drpatientmovie.com. Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in integrative and functional medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jill, and with each episode, we dive into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators who are at the forefront of medical research and practice, empowering you on knowledge and inspiration in your optimal health journey. Uh, hey guys, if you haven't heard, um, of course your head is probably in the sand, but my new movie, Dr. Patient is out, available for streaming anywhere you wanna watch. Just go to drpatientmovie.com. I am very looking forward to you checking that out. And most of all, just giving me feedback, sharing it with those you love or anyone who needs a little encouragement. Today, I am so excited for my guest. Dr. Jennifer Simmons is a prominent board certified breast surgeon in Philadelphia, where she was the chief of breast surgery and director of the breast program at Einstein Medical Center, Montgomery. With 15 years of experience in the field of breast disease, Dr. Simmons received the 2016 Top Honors Founders Award from the Living Beyond Breast Cancer Organization for improving the lives of women with breast cancer. Always on the forefront of medical advances in breast surgery, Jen has been named top doc six years in a row by Philadelphia Magazine and also in the main line today, 2018 and Suburban Life. Her warm, compassionate healing for women's health and wellness has also evident on camera. Reporters and producers turn to her for breaking medical breast cancer news. Dr. Jen, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me and for reading my bio, which is from like 10 years ago. <laughs> so I know, great. right? Yeah. <laughs> I, haven't heard, I haven't heard that one in a while. Oh. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I'm but, super excited because you've got a new book out. That's the that's a big part of me talking about that. Give us the title and then we're going to dive in and we'll share yeah. with you that. But. Yeah. So The Smart Woman's Guide to Breast Cancer is out. Um, and I really wrote this book because I spent all these years as a surgeon and as a surgeon, you you really help the person in front of you, but it's hard to help millions of people unless you have a way of reaching millions of people. And so my book is all about giving women the power and the ability to decide what is best for them and to also educate them in a way that is not happening. And I, I know it's not happening because I was on the forefront of that for many, many years. So we think that we're giving people an opportunity to make an informed decision, but what's happening is they're really making a rushed decision, right? They're in a heated rush. They're so scared. There's so much pressure. They don't understand the the treatments. They don't even understand the diagnosis or the disease. And I wanted people to understand. I wanted people to be able to know what breast cancer is and what it's not. I wanted people to understand the conventional treatments, but more importantly, what can you do for you to make that outcome better? 
what can you do for you to really achieve your best health after a breast cancer diagnosis? Because when I left surgery for functional medicine in 2019, I did it because I realized that our, our conventional medical system is broken. It's broken. Yeah. Now that is not to say that there are not, there's not value within the conventional medical world. There certainly is. And I'm not, I'm not taking away from that or detracting from that, but there's a time and a place. And for most of the things that we are using that conventional medical paradigm for, it doesn't work. It doesn't work in the area of chronic disease and nowhere is it better demonstrated than in a breast cancer population. Wow, Jen, I love that, Dr. Jen, um, because you and I are so aligned. And I think you know a bit about this, but one of the reasons I am so excited to have you here is 20 plus years ago at the age of 25, just literally days after my 25th birthday, I was diagnosed with aggressive ductal carcinoma. And so I have been that patient. And I love what you said. I want to dive into this because one of the things that I now share with patients and I felt as a breast cancer patient when I was told my diagnosis was the rush to make decisions, right? So for my history, it was, of course, a young woman. At that time, I was one of the youngest ever diagnosed in the Chicago area. Now, sadly, you know how it goes. There's 16, 18, 22, 25 is not as uncommon as it used to be. But at that time, of course, it was an aggressive ductal carcinoma in that age. And I was I was pushed pretty hard to decide on incredibly aggressive treatments. Now, what I ended up doing is three drug chemotherapy, multiple surgeries to get the clean margins and radiation. And I also did, thank goodness, some things to help heal uh, naturally, nutritional supplements, diet, lifestyle, prayer, meditation. But I'll never forget that pressure to make a decision. And I re resisted because I was like, I am going to take my time and make the right decision because I never want to go back and say, what if I would have, right? And I love, and I want to hear your perspective. So I'll stop talking in just a moment. But what I wanted to say is I never forget that pressure I felt. And then the actual resistance I had to put up to say, no, I'm going to take a week or two or three or four, whatever time I needed. I think it took me like three weeks to make a decision. I'm going to research and I'm going to look at all the data at this moment and make a decision. And I will never, ever, ever, ever go back and say, well, what if? Because I knew that would lead to dissatisfaction for the rest of my life. And so yeah. even though I had toxic, toxic chemo that has affected my immune system to this day, I have no regrets, right? So tell me about what you see with patients. Is that common, that kind of like a pressure to decide and the fear, right? It's driven by fear. 100%. It's so driven by fear. Um, and I just want to to say that in the very beginning of my book, I say the 12 things that you should know right now. And I say, it's okay at this point, if you take, if you breathe a sigh of relief, take a pause, get some perspective, you can handle this. And here are the 12 things that you need to know right now. Nothing else is urgent. It may feel that way. Breast cancer certainly feels like an emergency, but for most, the emergency is an emotional one. And the problem is our conventional medical system is taking advantage of that emotional emergency. They are taking advantage of that place that you're in, of fear, of vulnerability. And we have, unfortunately, farmed out our health to people who don't know how to make us healthy. We've farmed out our health to people who are incapable of making us healthy based on the information that they have. And I know this because I went to one of the finest medical schools in the country. Yes. And I know what I knew. And I know how I practiced for 15 years. And believe me, like I loved my patients. I wanted to help. I wanted to change the world. I wanted to make a difference in medicine. I wanted to make a difference in the area of breast cancer. I come from a breast cancer family. Like no one comes to their place without a reason. And mine is no different than anyone else's. I have a pain to purpose story just like everyone else. I was born into this breast cancer family where nearly all of the women in my family get breast cancer. The exception is my mother who had colon cancer. 
And when I was growing up, I had a cousin. Her name was Linda Creed. She was a singer-songwriter in the 1970s and 1980s. She wrote all the music for the spinners and the stylistics. She was the queen of Motown sound in Philadelphia. She was brilliant, beautiful, larger than life, lit up a room when she walked in. She wrote 54 hits, 54 hits. Her most famous song was The Greatest Love of All. Oh. So she wrote that song in 1977 as the title track to the movie, The Greatest, starring Muhammad Ali. But it really received its acclaim in March of 1986 when Whitney Houston would release that song to the world. And at that time, it would spend 14 weeks at the top of the charts. Only Linda would never know. Because Linda died of metastatic breast cancer one month after Whitney released the song. Oh. She was 37 years old. I was 16 years old when my hero died. Her life and ultimately her death gave birth to my life's purpose. I did the only thing I knew how to do because I never wanted another woman, another family, another community to have to suffer the way that mine suffered. So I went to medical school. I became a doctor. I was the first doctor in my family. But by golly, I was going to change this. I became a surgeon. I became the first fellowship trained breast surgeon in Philadelphia. And I did that really well and for a really long time. And I did it long enough for my aunt to be diagnosed. I did it long enough for my mother to be diagnosed with colon cancer. And I was about 15 years into my career, head of the department, running the cancer program for, for my hospital a wife, a mother, an athlete, a philanthropist. I have all these balls in the air. I think I'm an expert juggler until the day where everything comes crashing down for me. And I go from probably being one of the most high functioning people you've ever met in your life to I can't walk across the room because I don't have the breath in my body. And I go to see my friend and and colleague and physician and he tells me that I need surgery and chemo radiation and I'm going to be on lifelong medication and believe me I appreciate the irony these are things that I say all day every day without hesitation or reservation but when these words are coming at you they take on a whole new meaning and it was the first time that I ever really asked why? Why is this happening? Why is this happening to me? Why do I need that? How is that going to help me? Is it going to cure me? Am I going to have to worry about it again? Is it always going to be lurking over my shoulder? Now, these are questions that I got asked all day, every day, right? And I would answer them in the way that I was trying to answer them. Oh, it's multifactorial. There's nothing you can do to prevent it. There's nothing that you can do to reverse it. And we practice, and I'm guilty of this. So yeah. I'm not criticizing. Right. But we practice this paternalistic medicine. Don't worry your pretty little head. This is what you're going to do. Follow my instructions. And, you know, hopefully it'll be okay. And that hopefully is a big question mark. And also, when we say it's going to be okay, what we mean is we're going to tell you the statistics. There are five-year survival statistics. Five years. Yes. Five years. Five years to a 25-year-old, what does that mean? Right. Nothing. Nothing. Right? Yeah. For me, I mean, I was 46, five years to a 46-year-old with little tiny kids at home because I didn't have my kids till I was 37 and 40. Wow. Five years? Come on. Yeah. Like I'm going to look at my three-year-old and say, don't worry, mommy's going to live five years. Yeah. So I asked questions, didn't get answers, refused treatment. My friend told me I was going to die just like I told yes. thousands of women before who said, what will happen to me if I don't treat? And I would tell them that you will die of your disease. Oh. But there was something, there was something inside of me that said, there's more, yeah. go find it. And I did. And I found myself first 
looking towards nourishment because as a physician, we get almost no education around there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at that time in 2016, I went to Dr. Google, which was somewhat more reliable than Dr. Google is now because Dr. Google is now like uh -huh. just part <laughs> of the machine, but then not so much. And again and again and again, I got told that I need to look at my diet. Now, to me, I wasn't overweight. So how could I have a problem? How could that be an issue for me? And so I enrolled in the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, which is like a certificate health coaching course. But, you know, I was still working full time and still trying to be all the things that I was so accustomed to being. And so I decided to take this course and I'm sitting in this lecture hall. It's one of the first days and this tall, lanky guy walks on the stage and smiles this big toothy grin and introduces himself as a functional medicine physician. Now, at this point, I'm a doctor nearly 20 years because, you know, I'm out in practice five, uh, five, 15 years. I um, It takes five years to train as a surgeon and fellowship. So, you know, about 20 years, a little more than 20 years, I had been a physician at this point. And all I could think of was like, what is this quack talking about? There's no such thing as a functional medicine physician. And then I remember that I'm sick yeah, and I'm there for a reason. And so I check my big ego at the door and I tune in and thank God I did. Because wow. as it turns out, this quack was Mark Hyman. Oh, <laughs> right like I met me uh -huh. <laughs> um, and what he would have to say would not only forecast the rest of my life from a health standpoint but would forecast the rest of my life as a provider as a physician as a healer because what I learned on that day was that we have so much more control than we think. Yeah. And that 80% of what we know as chronic disease that allegedly can't be healed can be healed by changing the way that you eat, drink, move, think, sleep, all of these things that you can do. And then, you know, the 20% is. That's where the art is. That's where the magic is. And that's where, that's where I wanted to be able to get in there and help people. And I knew that I knew in that moment that I could heal myself, which took three years. So I don't want to like yes. gloss over it or make it <laughs> yeah. seem like it was easy or simple or anything like that. But that I knew that this is exactly what I was looking for. And I knew that the reason that I got sick was so that I could be in that room on that day to be put on this path. So I spent the next three years just emerged in the study of functional medicine. And for most people, that's a bell you can't unring. Yes. Once you hear that calling, you're <laughs> like, oh, yeah. This is what I'm supposed to do because this is what I set out to do. I set out to heal people, not to walk them over a bridge from one sickness to the next, because that's what I was doing as a surgeon. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I thought I was helping people, but you don't change the trajectory of the disease by cutting out the tumor because the tumor is not the problem. Yeah. The tumor is the symptom of the problem. Yeah. And I needed to take a long look at me and what I was doing and how I was living my life. Mm -hmm. And then I needed to take a long look at how I was practicing medicine. And I did. Wow. And I came out on the other side, a better person. And now I actually have the ability to help millions of women to achieve the health that they want, that they need, and that they deserve. Well, hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme, 
or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. What an amazing journey. I love it. And it parallels mine so much because we know um, there's this incredible knowledge we got in medical school and it made us who we are today. And I have so many similarities in your journey. But then once we go into medicine, really wanting to help and heal, and even your story at the beginning of all your family members and all the, the motivation that you had, but somewhere along the lines, we we lose, we get this ICD-10 and then here's a code and here's a surgery or medication to, to cure that. But we're not really, really reversing trajectory, like you said. No. And it's interesting. So many of us in functional medicine do have these journeys of either someone we love very near and dear to us that has gotten ill. And I remember years ago, everybody thought I was a crazy one in med school because I started looking at functional medicine in medical training and then in residency Every thought I was way out there. But nowadays it's those colleagues that call me when their husband, they don't have a cure for their autoimmune disease or there's this, so they're calling and saying, Jill, maybe do you have an answer because I'm not finding it. So unfortunately yeah. it's often coming to the end of a road conventionally. And again, you and I know for trauma, for acute surgery, for a heart attack, we've got the best medical system in the world. So I'm like you, Yeah, I find the value there, but there's more. It's like, but wait, there's more. So yeah. you had you had this own journey of your own healing and really dove into functional medicine. And obviously now you're taking that to the world with women with breast health and breast cancer. What about that woman out there who's 55 years old and um, feeling tired, feeling worried about breast cancer, feeling overwhelmed? Where do you start with these women who want help and want to either prevent uh, breast cancer or maybe who've just gotten a diagnosis? How do you take them yeah. on that journey? Yeah. So, um, I wish that they came to me before, but that's not happening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's not happening for most people because the truth is that it takes a lot to change and people don't change until the pain of staying the same is, is worse than the pain of potential change. So, you know, that woman that is tired, unfortunately is going to her primary care physician and is being told you're getting older. It's normal to be tired. Right. Mm -hmm. And that primary care physician isn't thinking about what you and I are thinking about that. If you're tired, your mitochondria aren't working well. Right. So why aren't your mitochondria working well? Because the mitochondria are the parts of the cell that generate ATP. That's our currency of energy. And if you're tired, you're not making enough ATP. And so I'm kind of that Sherlock Holmes person that's thinking about, well, what kinds of things affect your mitochondria? And not that I do the same thing for everyone, but you have to have a system of checks and balances to make sure you don't miss anything. So, you know, I'm just thinking about things from head to toe. What's the state of the mouth? Mm -hmm. Is your mouth healthy? Is your oral microbiome okay? Do you have dental amalgams? Because if you have dental amalgams, they're 50% mercury. So they are off gassing. I, I hear this all the time. Oh, I just have one little tiny metal amalgam in my mouth that's been there for 20 years. It's not a problem. It doesn't bother me. Okay, uh -huh. let's check your mercury levels and see, because every time, if you have a metal amalgam in your mouth, the longer it's been there, the more it's off gassing, not less, the more. Mm -hmm. And every time you run something hot by it, it off gasses more. Mm -hmm. So with every morning cup of coffee, with every cup of tea, with every bowl of soup, with every meal that's hot, you are off gassing. Right. And that is potentially harming your mitochondria. So I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about, do you have root canals? Mm -hmm. If you have root canals, that's a dead tooth in your mouth, a dead tooth that's doing nothing but rotting. Right. You would never keep a dead bone in your body. You would never keep a dead anything in your body. And yet we have somehow allowed for this system of keeping dead teeth in our mouth. So 
That's something I'm thinking about. Do you have chronic infection from that? Is your immune system so busy working on containing an, an infection there that it's not able to do its job anywhere else? And that's why you're tired. How's your gut? What does your gut microbiome look like? Do you have parasites? Because nearly everyone has parasites. I don't know if you've seen those mm -hmm. disgusting yes. videos on Instagram where they like cut into a banana because I hear people all the time, oh, I don't eat sushi. I don't eat raw meat, blah, 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 blah. Uh, okay. They cut into a banana. They put the slice under the microscope and there they are, the creepy crawlers mm. that you can only see under a microscope inside of your banana on top of your strawberries. Like they're there, they're everywhere. Parasites are everywhere. So, you know, is that an issue for you? And I'm literally walking down head to toe because we are one system, we're one system. And everything has to be operating in the system and everything has to be operating in harmony. And so, you know, that's what I'm doing for the person before. But the other thing that I'm really focused on is decreasing the number and the amount of toxins that we are exposing ourselves to, because that is the culprit for a lot of people for disease, for fatigue and for disease. And it's certainly the culprit for a lot of people for breast cancer. So, you know, there are the obvious ones that everyone knows, like don't drink out of plastic bottles and, and that kind of thing. Um, Try not to sniff gasoline when you're putting it inside of your car. Don't cook and not stick. Don't store or cook in plastic. You know, these things that most, these are things that most people know. But then we have totally normalized alcohol, mm -hmm. which is a major, major, major toxin, both in terms of liver function, because if your liver is busy detoxifying the alcohol, it can't do the rest of the things that it's supposed to do. And, you know, I'm sorry, ladies, to say and kind of don't shoot the messenger, but there is no safe amount of alcohol for women, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. I could not agree we, more on that. It's been sad that the media has given people a false a sense of, of safety. It's not true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's not true. It's absolutely positively not true. And- this is the one area, I mean, I guess there are others, but I hate to admit it. This is the one area that we are not equal to men. Men can tolerate alcohol in small doses in a way that we simply cannot. We just have too much else to detoxify that men don't. Yeah. And our bodies simply can't handle it. And the number of women that come to me because they are daily alcohol drinkers and subsequently develop breast cancer and say like, I'm not overweight. I'm not this, I'm not that. And all I do, all I do, yeah. all I do is have a glass of wine every day. I'm like, I put my pen down. I'm like, okay, I think we figured it out. Right. <laughs> right. Like, um, there's a normalization, happens. sadly, right? It's a like the social thing to do. And that yeah. is, yeah. So you you become that. I mean, even now I don't drink at all. And if I'm in a social situation, I'm still kind of the weird one. I'm okay with that. I am so fine with that. But still, even in my group of functional medicine kinds of people, it's still uncommon to be someone who doesn't drink at all. That's like- For sure. So. For sure. Absolutely. Um, but I talk about this all the time. It's just the first five minutes. Yeah. Like yes. when we all sit down for dinner. And so I just pull the, I'm just really thirsty. I'm just going to have some sparkling water and then I'll, and then I'll order something. And I don't do that because I don't care about, you know, I don't feel badly that yeah. I don't drink or anything like that, but it's sometimes easier to just not have the conversation. And I don't make that person sitting across from me feel badly. I'm up on my soapbox all day long. Yeah. I don't want to be on my soapbox at right. dinner with my friends, right? Like they are well aware of the things that I say if they follow me. And if they don't follow me, like that's on them, yeah. right? Everyone knows I'm out there talking. Right. If you're not listening, that's on you. But like, <laughs> I don't want to work at dinner, Yeah. right? 
So um, I love that actually, because it is, it's so uh, sad, whether it's gluten-free or alcohol or any of these things that we choose to not do or partake of, oh, come on, a little bit won't hurt you, right? We yeah. hear those kinds of things. And, All the and time. I think it's like, the, but I, I don't want to make them feel guilty. I, they can choose what they choose. So I love that kind of separate. And I'll often just get, if I'm in like a mixer where people don't know what I ordered, I'll get like a, a specialty glass with a Pellegrino and lime and it looks like a martini, right? And I'm just like, yeah. don't. Or I've yeah. even gone, again, I have no problem saying I don't drink, but I've even at, you know, some wedding or whatever, I'm holding a glass of wine. I'm not drinking it, but I just, it's just easier because it doesn't people ask questions. And again, I have no problem saying I don't drink. And most of the time I'm carrying water, but it just, it's not worth that conversation. And I don't want to have to justify, and I don't want to yeah. have to blame or make anyone else feel bad either. So I think yeah, that's actually that's exactly really right. practical. And, um, and again, it's not, it's not a secret. Yeah. Like, I think if you haven't heard that alcohol is bad for you, you're living in an alternate reality because I think it's out there enough and people talk about it enough. And so like everyone has to come to it in their own time, in their own way. And listen, do I do things that I know are bad for me? For sure. Yeah. Like I am not ready to go gray yet. Yes. Go I was going right? to say that one. I was like that in pedicures. I'm like, uh. so like <laughs> I get my hair colored uh -huh. every three weeks, come hell or high water. I get my hair colored every three weeks. I'm just not ready. Yeah. But do I do a ton of other things that I know are protecting me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And you can't do it all. And right. that's my trade-off. And so when people come to me with, can I do this? Can I do that? Can I do this? Can I do that? You pick your poison. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be perfect. Yeah. I mean, if you can be perfect, God bless you. Yeah. I'm just not that person. I'm yeah. not that person. I'm too vain. And I'm not that person. I'm not ready to not wear makeup. I pick the healthiest makeup I can, mm -hmm. but I'm not ready to not wear makeup. I'm not ready to not color my hair. I'm just not ready. Dr. I Jen, don't know I if I'll love, ever be ready. I was going to say, I love that you say that because, you know, people ask us questions. What do you use? What do you do? Oh my gosh, I can't believe you do that or whatever. I think this is really important because the concept here is margin. First of all, I remember when I first got diagnosed with cancer and realized, oh, toxic load, which is what you're talking about and what we both mm -hmm. feel is so critical. And I realized, oh, bath and body products and makeup and air fresheners. And I went through over two years, my whole house, my whole regimen changed everything that I could right? And that's an important part of this, but it takes time. It can be expensive and you have to choose number one, what can you afford? Number two, what's the priority? And what you want to do is create enough margin in your toxic load bucket that you can have one or two things or whatever things that are really, really important exactly. for you, unless you're perfect out there, which God bless you. If you are, you, yeah. you and I, Dr. Jen are probably not. God bless you. Right. I am and far I, from perfect. Yeah, so if you're perfect, too. good for you. Um, <laughs> But I, I love that you said that, that because I that think that's be actually giving, yeah, and giving permission for people to do the very best you can in yeah. every area that you can. And yeah. what should happen is our bodies are detox machines. So if we had just a small amount of toxic load every day, we should be able to handle that. It's yes. when the uh, exponential increase in environmental chemicals are being put into our environment, our hair, our makeup, and as you know, as young as eight or 10 years old, we start putting things on our body that are toxic. That's when the toxic load goes up and starts to over- It actually yeah. happens way before then, if you think about it, because even the baby products, yes. they're not safe. Yeah. They're not safe. They're terrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes. if people are putting aquaphor on their baby. It's a petroleum product. Right. Like terrible, terrible, yeah. terrible. I, and you know, I try to say this to my stepdaughters, but you have to be very, very careful when right. you're a stepmom and a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be very careful about what you say to them or they stop telling you things. Um, but you know, it's hard. It's hard. And you're fighting a really big and powerful machine. And there's so much greenwashing. And there's so much all of that. So, you know, from the best advice that I give people is just try to do less. Yes. Use less products. Yeah use things that are really clean. Like I don't put anything on my skin other than pure organic almond oil. That works for me. Right. Like I just feel that that works for me. And so I'm not spending a lot of money on products and I'm going to do this for as long as it works for me. And then if it doesn't work for me, I'll, you know, figure something else out, but you get rid of a lot of the face creams and the, this and the, that, and it, and, and it works. Yeah. Um, but decreasing your toxic load 
and, you know, making sure that you are using less cleaning your house. We clean our house with a mm -hmm. mixture of vodka and water and lemon and it works. Yes. Um, but my kids don't love the laundry detergent that I have selected. Like they want Tide. And so we fight about that and I win and they complain and, you know, it is what it is. Yes. Um, but you know, again, you said little by little, these things, these organic non-chemical based things are definitely more expensive and, you know, yeah. not, not as effective, let's say, but I also think that we need a little germ in our life yes. because mm -hmm. when you disinfect your world, you're actually not even allowing your immune system to do what it's supposed to do. You're not allowing it to be educated. You're not allowing it to grow and blossom. And that's a huge problem. I mean, that's why antibiotics are such a huge problem. Mm. And also they act as um, xenoestrogens. Exactly. But in thinking about our toxin exposure, like one of my major, major platforms is radiation. Mm. Because we know yes. that radiation is a known carcinogen, a known carcinogen, right? And yet, if you ask a radiologist, do mammograms cause breast cancer? They will universally say no. How is it possible? How is it possible that all other radiation causes cancer, but mammograms, because we named them this lovely name, mammogram, picture of the breast, uh -huh. right? Instead of calling it what it is, which is an X-ray of the breast, Yes. suddenly it doesn't cause breast cancer. Come on, give me a break. So I am really on a platform to educate people about breast cancer screening, about breast cancer prevention, and having a plan that does not include getting radiated every year, because that is a surefire way to guarantee that you're going to get a breast cancer. Yes. So and let's do this real practical. Say I'm 35 and I'm like, oh, yeah. you know, what, Dr. Sims, what do I do for, um, what do I do for uh, screening? What would you tell yeah. me? So I fully believe in self-breast examination. I think it's really important to know yourself, know your body, know what you feel like when you're normal so that you can recognize when there's been a change. Mm -hmm. Newsflash. Every woman thinks her breasts are lumpy. Every woman. So know, yeah. know what they feel like. And so that you can notice a change. And if you notice a change, so you know, I have no problems with diagnostic studies. Yeah. What I have a problem with is taking the normal healthy population because that's what we're talking about. The screening population is an asymptomatic woman, a woman without any issues. But if you feel something, you're no longer asymptomatic. I think that that's where the risk benefit ratio makes sense. And you can go have an ultrasound, go have a mammogram if they insist, although I don't think they're that helpful. And, you know, do what is whatever is required to get to the bottom of, of whatever symptom you're having. But in the normal healthy population, you should be examining your breasts. If you are menstruating, it should be one week after the start of your menstrual cycle. If you're no longer menstruating, it should be the first of every month. Just look at your breasts, see what they look like, arms down by your side, up over your head. You're looking for dimpling. You're looking for a change in the skin. You're looking for redness. Feel around the breast, use your fingertips. It's a circumferential exam where you're going from outside to in and just gliding your fingertips over the tissue. And if you're going to feel something abnormal, it's going to feel like a bump in the road. And then, you know, if you don't feel anything, you don't need anything more. Most women are not comfortable with that. Most women want to be more proactive than that. So let's talk about the imaging that exists now. So there's mammogram, but I don't believe that any asymptomatic woman should be radiated for the purposes of screening for breast cancer. I don't think that we should be using a test that causes cancer mm -hmm. to screen for cancer. 
in a low risk population. There's ultrasound. Mm -hmm. Ultrasound will not pick up calcifications. I could make an argument that calcifications don't matter because what they what they can a fraction of the time represent is DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ. And I can argue that that is not breast cancer yeah. and that we should not be treating it like breast cancer because DCIS on its own has 100% survival. DCIS that's been treated like it's invasive breast cancer yes. has a 97% survival. Wow. Because we're killing people with the treatments of breast cancer. Yes. This is a problem. It's a problem. We can't treat someone for a non-life-threatening disease and give them heart disease or give them osteoporosis or give them dementia or Alzheimer's. We can't do that. We can't take away their quality of life. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing when we're treating these women who have DCIS, a non-life-threatening disease. We're treating them with like they have invasive cancer. And we are shortening the duration of their life and significantly interfering with the quality of their life. And it's wrong. It's immoral. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be doing it. So I think ultrasound is a perfectly viable option, but it's a low resolution option. It leads to a lot of biopsies. 75% mm -hmm. of those biopsies are going to be benign. So three quarters of the time, people who undergo biopsy for something that's found on a mammogram and ultrasound, that's going to be benign and they didn't need that biopsy. And biopsies are pretty anxiety provoking. And for women, once they've had a breast biopsy, it's like a bell that they can't unring. Mm -hmm. Like they think that they're high risk. Yes. Um, and they're kind of forever waiting for the other shoe to drop. And it's a terrible place to put someone for no reason because the biopsy was benign, right? So not a great system. There is MRI. MRI was thought to be the solution because it is such a high resolution study, but MRIs inherently have their own problems. Yeah. So first of all, they're very expensive. Mm -hmm. Very expensive. So it's not a good screening tool just on that basis alone. But they also are not terribly comfortable. I don't know if you've ever had a breast MRI, mm -hmm. but they're no, they're no walk in the park. There's access issues mm -hmm. because though, you know, I live in the suburbs of Philadelphia, we have plenty of MRI machines. There are plenty of places that don't have our MRI machines. And so it's not a viable screening option for that reason, because there's access issues. But the biggest problem that I have with MRI has nothing to do with expense or being uncomfortable or access. The biggest problem is that in order for it to be an effective study, it requires gadolinium. Yes. Gadolinium is a heavy metal. So we're- I interviewed the world expert on gadolinium on the podcast. So if you are watching and you haven't seen that episode with Dr. Richard, um, he's written all the papers on the research. And he was a, I just want to say, I'm sure you know this, Dr. Simmons is, he was a radiologist, one of the heads of development of MRI. And he started realizing, what if I'm giving my patients issues by ordering all these contrast MRIs? And he started studying and he's the first radiologist speaking out, writing about how this can create toxicity in a percentage of the population. And I, I just love his bravery um, yeah. because it is an issue. Yeah. It is an issue and it's scary to come out. Yes. Right. It's scary to come out against all of these places. I mean, I get attacked all the time, all the time, because I say things that make radiologists feel really uncomfortable. But if you feel uncomfortable about something, you ought to ask why. Yes. Because why would me, if, if I was so off of my rocker, if what I was saying wasn't true, why would it make you feel uncomfortable, right? And so I wish that people were so much more curious than they were defensive. Yeah. But everyone gets defensive instead of saying, wait, is that true? Is she onto something? Yeah. <laughs> Have I, am I really doing the right thing? But the problem is that, you know, they're operating in a system and they believe what they were told. Listen, I was told mammograms yeah. save lives. 
I, I, I trained believing mammograms saved lives. I ordered thousands of map. I can't even count how many mammograms right. I ordered over the years. Can't even count, right? But we all have to know that, you know, if you're not embarrassed over something that you did six months ago, you're not learning. Right. And I'm, I'm embarrassed over things I did six weeks ago because I'm constantly learning and I'm constantly trying to hone my craft and do better. And we can't rest on our laurels. And what we believe to be true is not true for a lot of things. I mean, listen, I came out of surgical residency in 2003 with the release of the Women's Health Initiative. Yes. Like I was told that hormones cause breast cancer right. and I believed it. Yep. Hook, line and sinker, I believed it. I mean, the guy who trained me was like one of the world experts in breast cancer. And he sat me down in my fellowship and he said to me, hormones cause breast cancer. And if you, the only person that should go on hormones is the person that absolutely positively cannot live without them. Yeah. And if you put them on hormones, it should be the smallest amount for the least amount of time. Right. That was it. In the same era as you in exact yeah. same training. And yeah. Women's health initiative. Yeah. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. That's the only person that gets hormones, smallest amount, least amount of time. And then what happened in 2017? Yes. They retracted that whole paper. Right. Did anyone read it? No. Right. No. And if so, I recollect the estrogen only arm, which was Premarin, not even bioidentical, had a 34% reduction in reduction. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. 34. It was either 34 or 38. I can't remember now. Somewhere there, but right? It was, it was <laughs> definitely a reduction, right? right? Right. Did we talk about that? Right. Right. No. 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 Now, I mean, there are so many things that were wrong with that study that I can't even get into it right now, but that there are so many things that we have been told that we knew definitively to yes. be true, yes, which that. were not true. I just right? love your humility here because I feel the same way. Like we really are learning every day, every year, every month, every the day. truth. And if we're not okay to, to basically come out and say, wait, we thought this in medicine and we were wrong. Let's change yeah. the paradigm. And yeah. I'm assuming I really want people to be able to get your book. I'm assuming you really dive into these issues in the book, right? Like if people- want I to, do. Yeah. So I do. Pull that I up again and, sh and share the title yeah. so people see yeah. that. So it's the about. Smart Woman's Guide to yeah. Breast Cancer. And honestly, I mean, this book is, if you have breast cancer, if you were recently diagnosed, if you're in treatment, if you've completed treatment and you're wondering now what, or if you had a remote history of breast yes. cancer, this book is for you. But beyond this, this book is for anyone who really cares about their health. Because at the end of the day, yes. breast health is health. Breast health is health. And the very same things that are going to give you a healthy breast are going to give you a healthy brain, healthy bones, healthy heart, a healthy yeah. gut, healthy muscles, healthy joints, healthy vagina, healthy, yep. your, your, like healthy. Everything. Right? Yeah. It's the same thing. We are one system. Yeah. And so this book really is your path to health. Yeah. And that's why I wrote it. Now, will there be three different iterations of this book? For sure. Yeah. I, I will write a book on prevention. I'm going to write a book on hormone replacement, especially in the breast cancer population, because this is a population of women who they're discarded. Yes. They're ignored. And they're uh, scared. Even when we're talking, they're scared Yeah, talk about because fear. they think that hormones mm -hmm. cause breast cancer, Yeah, but it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous notion. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we believe estrogen causes breast cancer, then at the same time, we have to believe that every woman was put on this earth for the purposes of developing right, breast right. Cancer. I mean, you think about the levels of estrogen as we're menstruating, and there's it makes no sense at all. This is a, so it uh, makes no sense at all, right? Or yeah. look at pregnant women. I yeah. in my in my career, and I treated thousands and thousands and thousands of women for breast cancer. I was the but I treated more women for breast cancer than anyone else in Philadelphia in my career. Wow. I saw two pregnant women 
my entire career to, I treated two pregnant women. Wow. I treated plenty of men. Yeah. Yep. I, I treated two pregnant women. It just doesn't happen that frequently. Mm-hmm. And yet the levels of estrogen in a pregnant woman are 10 times right. that, right? And that's our most proliferative estrogen. That's our estradiol. That's our really stimulatory estrogen. So the whole explanation that hormones cause cancer is a narrative. It's a narrative for us to believe because we have hormone blockers, Mm -hmm. right? We have estrogen blockers, but they're acting on the estrogen receptor because the estrogen receptor is protective. Yes. And I could make an argument that putting women on hormone replacement would do the same thing Yeah, yeah. as many it's... of these hormone blockers without sacrificing their health, without mm-hmm. sacrificing their heart, their brain, their bones, their vagina, right. their libido, their mood, their gut. Well, I, it is time on on. for us to stand up and say this and get the yeah. truth out there. And there are hundreds of thousands of women that have suffered too long. Dr. Simmons, this has been so fun to talk to you. I love your passion and the place it comes from is so similar because we've both been there and then found the light of functional medicine and have this passion for sharing it in the world. And I'm so glad that you've written this book and that women can get a copy. Where can people find you? Where can they get a copy of the book? Where can they learn more about your work? Well, well, most excitingly is you can find me Uh, at perfection imaging, because this is a new imaging technique that um, does not involve pain, does not involve compression. We are screening for breast cancer using sound waves, using ultrasound waves, but in a completely novel revolutionary way that creates a true 3D reconstruction of the breast with 40 times the resolution of MRI. Wow. So this is going to replace mammogram, ultrasound, and MRI for screening. The first center will be open on the East Coast in the suburbs of Philadelphia. So it's called perfection imaging, but the perfection is spelled with a Q in the middle instead of a C. And you can find that at perfectionimaging.com. So come in and have your screening study. Um, and again, painless and the safest, most affordable, most effective way to screen for breast cancer. Um, and then you can find my website, which is realhealthmd.com. And there are all my programs there. Um, you can also find my book there, the smart woman's guide to breast cancer or on Amazon, And then you can find me on all the social media outlets at Dr. Jen Simmons. And my Jen has two N's. Awesome. Dr. Jen with two N's. This has been amazing. I could talk to you for another two hours because we have (laughs) such a common passion with our histories and, and with just really getting the word out for women that they don't have to live in fear. Thank you for writing the book. Thank you. I am so excited to hear and collaborate and promote your centers for the imaging because this is a real, real practical answer to all of the fear mongering and the ineffective and the issues that we've had that we already spoke about. So thank you. Thank you for the work that you do. It is absolutely delightful to talk to you. And uh, I'll be one of the first ones out there to get my imaging. Amazing. Well, (laughs) we can't wait to see you. Thank you.